Okay, uh, so this is uh, week five of the lectures, and uh, we shall continue discussing about Navier-Stokes uh, equation today. Before, but before we go on, uh, I want you to give an idea of the numbers. We have spent quite some time deriving various times, uh, various terms like the shear stress, the properties of the shear stress, various um, and the velocity gradient tensor, and so on and so forth. But uh, can we make sense of fluid flow in our daily life experience? We, we need to get an idea of the numbers and how to use it. So, um, I mean, there's something which you might all know, that the atmospheric pressure is uh, 10 to the power 5 pascals. Uh, pascals uh, is basically Newton per meter square. That's the, that's the, SI unit. Um, so 10 to the power 5 newtons per meter square is the amount of force which is acting on one meter square. I mean, I guess you know how much is one meter, uh, one meter square, right? I mean, we are mostly uh, 1.5 to 2 meters in height. So you have an idea about uh, what one meter is, hopefully. Uh, so one newton uh, is the force which is required to accelerate one kg of mass um, to as, uh, by an acceleration of me one meter per second square, right? And on the Earth's surface, one kg of mass essentially gives 10 newtons force, um, right? So if you were to visualize what 10 to the power 5 Pascal means, you could think that you essentially have 10 to the power 4 kg. 10 to the power 4 kg will give 10 to the power 5 newtons force in one meter square. So you could think that the pressure uh, that we feel, and of course that's my, uh, uh, balanced by internal pressure, uh, is equivalent to 10 to the power 4 kg or 10 tons kept in one meter square. So that's the pressure. That's the so-called um, thermodynamic pressure that, that we feel uh, when there's nothing moving and so on and so forth, right? Assuming uh, we are in setting in equilibrium, of course, there's always some wind motion and so on and so forth, but there's an ideal, uh, there's an estimate of the thermodynamic pressure. Uh, an incredibly important thing, number to remember, and I want you to remember this number in the exam. I won't be telling you this number. You should at least go out of the course uh, with the uh, with where you, if you remember the air viscosity, which is two into ten to the power minus five pascal seconds, and air viscosity is and the water viscosity is essentially fifty times more uh, than that of the air viscosity uh, and it is around 10 to the power 3 minus 3 pascal second. Pascal second is the SI unit for viscosity. And note that I mentioned that the, I also mentioned the temperature. So this, uh, these numbers are valid uh, for at around 20, 25 degrees centigrade. And as I mentioned before, when you heat water, uh, from say 20 degrees centigrade or 25 degrees centigrade to 100 degrees centigrade, uh, the viscosity of water decreases by a factor of four. Okay, uh, but uh, air viscosity, if you go from 18 to 100 degrees centigrade, it increases by 20 percent. So water, the viscosity decreases. Uh, air, the viscosity increases, but only by 20 percent so basically you this you would have uh something like i think 20 percent of two is um, 10 percent of two is 0.2 and uh, 20 percent of uh two is uh, uh, 0.4 so you'll have 2.4 into 10 to the power minus 5 um viscosity at 100 degrees centigrade on the other hand uh you see that the decrease in of viscosity for water is quite drastic and the reason for that is the following that the origin of the viscosity the mechanism the physics the microscopic physics of the viscosity uh, for air and water is very different for air basically what you have is if in a region you have high momentum 
I mean, I want you to remind you that this causality uh, comes from collisions, uh, right? And uh, for, for air, basically, molecules move from one region to the other, carrying momentum. There's a large, uh, there is a large um, mean free path for air molecules. So basically, um, there's also transport of momentum remember this is not fluid mem uh, this is not fluid flow momentum that is handled by navier stokes this is the microscopic origin of viscosity so remember viscosity is also or viscosity by rho the density of the fluid is called the kinematic viscosity and that is essentially uh, like the diffusion constant for transport of momentum right and uh, momentum can be transported even without direct fluid flow uh, the way to picture is is uh, this because you know uh, you can have fluid flow in this direction but momentum can be transported in this direction and that is by diffusion that's because um, there is momentum exchange between different layers of the fluid and uh, if it's air it's basically that some molecules having higher momentum here is going from this region to the re this region remember the flow lines are parallel but we are really talking within a fluid element within a fluid element how are atoms and molecules colliding um, so if our air molecules will actually transport momentum by physically going from one, this one region to the next region and of course there will also be collisions and by collisions there will be momentum exchange um, uh, so that will also happen but on the other hand the 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 mean free path for water molecules would be order of some nanometers suppose a water molecule is around two or three angstrom in size let's assume or maybe even smaller but uh, yeah i mean two or three angstrom and it is densely packed by other molecules so there are much more frequent collisions and the momentum transport um, um, in water is not that the water molecules are going from one region to the other they are colliding more and thereby transferring momenta from one to the other each particle each water molecule is surrounded by many other water molecules and there's a attractive force between the water molecules that's why it is liquid first of all and not a gas and if you heat uh, water molecules basically they can more easily uh, first of all they get some gain some momentum uh, energy because you are kbt and because they're at a higher uh, energy and thereby they can overcome uh, the attraction uh, between its neighbors and collide and relax and uh, interchange its position by collisions and so on and so forth so that is the reason um, and if we have a higher temperature it is more easy for the water molecules to overcome uh, the attraction and relax its surroundings. Basically, relax its surroundings means change its interposition uh, distance. So, so it's not trapped, essentially, if you like. And higher temperatures helps that. Hence, uh, hence, actually, water, if you heat, the viscosity decreases because it is able to relax more easily and change its surroundings, go and collide more. Uh, um, on the other hand, if it was trapped by neighbors, it would, uh, it would, it can collide only with its neighbors and not break the cage and collide with other uh, slightly distant particles and transfer momentum. Uh, right. Uh, so, so, so uh, for water, the viscosity decreases as you increase. Uh, as you increase the temperature uh, and on the other hand for air it increases because there will be more frequent collisions for air and vis uh, vis viscosity increases just to give an idea of the numbers uh, if you have air in a storm um, what would be the kind of forces that you will feel uh, just to remind you over and above uh, the pressure the thermodynamic pressure Yeah. 
uh, you have also eta del v x del x, right? Uh, uh, this is like uh, over the mechanical pressure and so on and so forth. It, it's, it sits in the diagonal elements of the, with the deviatoric stress. And for it to have an effect, suppose you're standing next to a wall, um, so, and suppose you can feel order of one Newton force. So how much would del v x del x have to be uh, or similarly uh, uh, or similarly uh, what were the forces if suppose we're looking at the off diagonal terms del v y del x okay so let's first talk about del v x del x uh, because that sits in the diagonal uh, that's in uh, sits in the diagonal terms of the stretch tensor so basically suppose uh, you know the air viscosity is 2 into to the power minus 5 and if the air was moving at even 100 kilometers, uh, sorry, 100 meters per second, just to remind you, 10 meters per second is 36 kilometers per hour. You can just calculate it. it. And 100 meters per second is 360 kilometers per hour. So that's a very strong storm, right? Now, suppose the air came to rest. So del V x, the velocity was high, close to the wall. It came to rest uh, over one centimeter, right? Uh, even then, if you just calculate 2 into 10 to the minus 5, one centimeter is 10 to the power minus 2, right? So basically, the force which will contribute in the diagonal term over and above pressure is only 10 to the power minus 1 si unit 0.1 newton and that's a very sharp drop so the drop has to be even over one millimeter so that you can feel the that force uh force of one newton so right on the other hand close to the uh, so why do you feel forces uh, as the air passes you if it is uh, if you need such uh, so basically, there's a concept of boundary layer, which we shall discuss later in the course, uh, later in today's class. Basically, uh, the viscous effects can be felt. The boundary layer is the region over which viscous effects can be uh, fe uh, felt. The, that is the length scale over which uh, there's a sharp gradient. And we'll, I'll show you that it's order of one millimeter um, as, we, uh, as I shall show you later. So if you were swimming and viscosity is 10 to the power minus 3, which sounds less, but let's look at uh, what is the kind of numbers that you get. Now, the boundary layer, as I told you, is you would a priori think that if you are swimming, if you are moving uh, maybe your hand, uh, you, you're swimming at 1 meters per second and moving your hand uh, and uh, pulling uh, the water at around, suppose, 10 meters per second. That's what, I guess, um, swimmers, Olympic swimmers would do. And since you are 1 meter away from the wall, let's say, uh, is that the velocity gradient? Is that the right velocity gradient? Then the viscosity, then the force that you would feel is 10 to the power minus 3 into 10 meters per second. And suppose 1 millimeter, uh, one meter is the length scale over which the velocity changes. The wall is, uh, the water, the wall is static and you are moving. Then the force that you will get is 10 to the power minus 2 SI unit. Obviously, that's extremely sm small, right? And that's not what your uh, experience is. You have to actually pull quite hard uh, to to swim if you have had uh, that experience or you might have uh, been in a pond or wherever in a swimming pool or a river or a lake or whatever the reason is that the velocity gradient is not 10 meters per second uh, by one meter it is one millimeter this the length scale of the boundary layer is one millimeter and that is the length scale over which um, uh, the velocity is changing so if you put that 10 to the minus 3, then you will see that you are essentially have to give 10 newtons per meter square. And your body surface would be, uh, um, I guess, half a meter square or something like that. So 
So then that is the right number. It's not one meter, but one millimeter because the boundary layer is order of one millimeter. And that is the length scale over which uh, the velocity changes. Of course, here I uh, assumed that things are more like a steady state uh, flow. In reality, you will have vortices. Uh, when you swim, you will have turbulence. But those will be additional sources of uh, drag. The, the viscous effects will be much more than that. The drag effects will be much more than that. So this knife, even if you put one millimeter and you get basically 10 newtons um, per second, per meter square per second, so that uh, is just an underestimate. But at least it's a number which you can make sense of, right? Even though the viscosity is here 10 to the minus 3, dv dx will be much higher so that you'll get 10 newtons per meter square per second. So that's the thing, um, kind of drag you will feel. That's the minimal drag. In actual, it will be more than that because of um, it, it's not a steady state flow. There will be turbulence and so on and so forth. What is it? Uh, so this is the thing which I wanted to stress, that basically, if you have steady flow, uh, then outside the boundary layer for non-turbulent flow and at low Reynolds number. What is Reynolds number? What is boundary layer? Uh, we'll discuss as we go along. Um, and Reynolds number is rho. Rho is the density of fluid. U is the characteristic uh, flow speed. L is the characteristic length over flow is happening. And eta is the viscosity of the fluid. At low Reynolds number flow, when you have non-turbulent fluid, Outside the boundary layer, you can assume by left flow. That's a pretty good assumption. But boundary layer exists, and there's a very strong viscous effects there. And if you just take Euler flow, you can't explain a lot of things. Example, how a plane flies, and so on and so forth. OK, so this was an, a quick brief introduction to numbers. Uh, this is the essentially the Navier-Stokes equation, which we saw last time, which we derived uh, here intentionally. I've kept the density inside del del t, uh, inside the various derivatives, so that it is momentum equation. I can emphasize that there's a momentum transport. And uh, what we are essentially looking at is the rate of change of momentum provided explicitly as a function of time and as a function of x, y, z. And for this to be non-zero, one either needs a body force or a pressure gradient or a divergence of the stress tensor or a combination of all of these. But if all of these are zero, then this will be zero. Now, this is a body force, something like gravity, which is pulling the entire mass of a fluid, say. This is a pressure gradient. Mechanical pressure gradient is what you should uh, be uh, thinking about, the uh, how, how much force is being applied per unit area, and how is that rate of uh, force changing as a, how is, the, I mean, per, per unit distance, how much force is being applied. It also has, uh, just to remind you, this is uh, pressure. Pressure it has units of energy per unit volume. And this is grad of pressure. So this is some force. Uh, continuously, force is being applied, uh, or there's a pressure gradient uh, across x. Then that will cause a change in the flow, and this is divergence of the stress tensor. Just to remind you, divergence of the stress tensor uh, looks like this. And since I'm using the dash, it means that the thermodynamic pressure uh, has been uh, integrated out, I mean, it's been written separately. Right. And the other thing to note is, you know, uh, compared to the thermodynamic pressure, which is 10 to the power 5 pascals, all these forces, uh, even if the, they were there, or mechanical pressure that you feel uh, is relatively much smaller uh, than 10 to the power 5 pascals. Because here you are getting 10 to the power 1 unit and 1 newton per 
uh, one newton per meter square so you can really think even in a in a in a in a flow that thermodynamic pressure relatively quantitatively is 10 to the power 5 and this is force that you feel over and above that right so so th this divergence of sigma is eta laplacian of the velocity vector and uh, this is the bulk viscosity but remember even the shear viscosity appears here but usually divergence of v equal to zero and uh, for incompressible fluid so typically you would see uh, divergence uh, of sigma dash would be eta grad square v uh, and this term is typically missing in the when when you work with it but if you were really working with uh, compressible flow especially when you have velocity gradients over extremely small distances high velocity gradients over extremely uh, small distances then this term can be non zero and it can contribute so for in and by the way uh, you can write this eta uh, the divergence of stress tensor uh, as e take to lambda square v where you have assumed that you have a newtonian fluid what is a newtonian fluid a newtonian fluid is basically the viscosity i mean the the stress tensor uh, in different directions just depends upon uh, viscosity isotropic and homogeneous right in reality you can have complex fluids where the viscosity itself can be a function of the flow rate or uh, or the stress tensor can can uh, can be uh, complex functions of the velocity gradient but for a newtonian fluid it is simple the stress tensor is uh, eta del v del uh, del v x del y right for for plane of flows so so assuming a newtonian fluid you have this term but of course in a real fluid you could be much more complex than this so even if you look at this equation this is a nonlinear term, right? V dot grad, and this can bring in huge amounts of complexity. Um, uh, people who have done the computational physics course, they can see that the nature of the um, for nonlinear equations, the nature of the solutions can change as different parameters in front of equations change. Uh, in fact, in our case also, you can have steady state flow, but at higher uh, flows. Um, you have highly turbulent flow the nature of the flow itself changes and so this is the uh, origin of various complexities now as we'll see again today in a bit that if you have relatively low reynolds number velocity gradients are low velocity is low then this term doesn't contribute and then it becomes a linear equation uh, for incompressible flow this term is can be neglected so you typically see only these uh, terms which are in black where uh, assuming incompressible flow i have written the rho f outside the del del t and here also i've taken out rho f the density of the fluid outside the gradient terms so this these black ones are the ones you see as the navier stokes equation but in case you want to neglect viscosity as well th this are the terms which would appear in the euler equation in real fluids uh, of course viscosity is there except for superfluids but you can work with the euler equation as long as you are looking at flows outside the boundary layer the other term uh, point is as a emphasize even if you don't have complexities coming from this nonlinear term if you don't have a newtonian fluid you can ha have extra terms in a sitting in with the viscosity terms so you could have extra terms and that could have uh, extremely nonlinear extra complexities and of course if you have this and nonlinearities from here of course the thing is much more complicated Right. So this is what the Navier-Stokes equation is. Uh, basically, these terms plus compressible term. 
just to give you an idea more of uh, what this viscosity means as i said before that kinematic viscosity which is this new is eta by rho and that uh, is the diffusion constant for momentum transport which means that suppose you have two walls and this wall is set into motion uh, you are used to seeing this profile but remember this is only at steady state only after this steady state profile has been achieved when uh, velocity is not changing as a function of time on the other hand if you have static fluid between these two walls you keep this fixed and make this suddenly start um, moving this with velocity v0 uh, what you will see that the layer the layer of fluid which is sticking to the wall will start also start moving whereas this of uh, this amount this the fluid here will be completely static but only after a bit of time uh, will this layer of the fluid which was dragging which was moving along with the wall will drag this layer of fluid with it so the fluid profile uh, the velocity profile that you will see is something like this and the rest of it is static but as momentum uh, diffuses downwards it, this layer of fluid is going to drag this layer of fluid and this layer of fluid is going to drag this layer of fluid so, so finally you would have velocity profiles which is more like this and after much time it will reach steady st uh, steady steady state flow where you will have this linear velocity profile question over what period of time if the distance between walls was suppose one millimeter uh, oh you start this you start this wall you start moving this wall at time t equal to zero after how many seconds will this effect reach this point the the momentum transport will reach this point R remember reaching steady state will take more time but i'm just asking the question after how many seconds will this layer of fluid actually feel the effect that this is moving that will be the odd time of momentum transport how would you do it a new equal to has dimensions of the kinematic viscosity has dimensions of l square by t and eta is 10 to the minus 3 this is a 10 to the power minus 3 this is 10 to the power 3 so nu is 10 to the power minus 6 and uh, if you put time scale equal to 1 second so in 1 second uh, momentum will be transported diffusively transported over 10 to the power minus 3 meters so l i'm just take the square root you'll get a 10 to the minus 3 meters which is essentially one millimeter so basically if you move this wall the fluid here will feel the effect it will feel that there's a, a shear stress uh, there's a momentum diffusion only after one second and of course if the distance between walls was suppose two millimeters it would feel uh after two seconds right because the a momentum is diffusively transported order of one millimeter in one second so that's the idea other than navier-stokes equation to solve the problem what you need is also the boundary conditions and as we discussed last time uh, that fluid does, uh, at the near a solid doesn't penetrate the solid so the perpendicular velocity of this uh, so the fluid in the normal direction in the direction normal to the surface of the solid uh, will have the same velocity as the uf normal uh, this being the velocity the normal uh, component of the fluid velocity because if the wall moves it is going to push the fluid as well the fluid cannot enter the wall uh, if it is static, then this will also be static, it will be zero. And if, uh, furthermore, if you have viscosity, the fluid is going to stick to the wall. Um, and the consequence of which that the parallel component, the co component of the velocity of the fluid, which is parallel to the surface um, of the solid, uh, it will have equal velocity as that of the boundary so these are the boundary conditions you need to solve it 
the next thing I'm going to do is basically write Navier-Stokes equation in the dimensionless form. Uh, why? Because that will help us. Uh, that that will help us uh, basically uh, explain uh, the idea of Reynolds number. Okay. Uh, here I have written down uh, the Bernoulli's equation. And one has to remember, one can use Bernoulli's equation only along a streamline. And this is called this term is called the dynamic pressure. This is the kinetic energy term. This is the pressure term, uh, energy per unit volume. And the pressure, actually, if you are, uh, as I discussed in some class, that uh, when fluid essentially moves through a thinner, thinner pipe, then this part increases and that leads to a drop in pressure. And this is any term uh, which is coming from, suppose, the body forces, some conservative forces, right? And this is constant along a streamline and sometimes it is called a Bernoulli constant. As long you have a streamline, you can use this equation to calculate pressure at different points along a streamline. Uh, but of course, you need to have a streamline. And for turbulent flow, you don't have, right? I mean, continuous streamlines, you have turbulent flow where it is moving in different directions and so on and so forth. Well, you can define it uh, as long as you can define a streamline, you can use this. Uh, yeah. Um, there can be viscous energy dissipation also, but we are not d discussing that yet. Uh, the other thing uh, uh, is that suppose there was a, a fluid flow, average fluid flow velocity far away from this wall or object which blocks the fluid uh, is suppose you, but of course close to the wall there will be deviations and there will be del u x del uh, del u y del uh, del x and del u x del y and so on and so forth but the characteristic velo uh, characteristic velocity you could think it to be u and uh, this dimension is suppose l and then the characteristic time of motion would be l by u so that's the time over which um, the fluid we will move a distance l um, if it's moving with distance u. Of course, you're going to ha also have a characteristic energy scale, and that will be half rho f u squared, the kinetic energy, uh, right? Uh, so, so, so this is the Navier-Stokes equation, rho f del v del t plus rho f v dot grad v equal to minus grad p and plus eta nabla square v. What we're going to first do, is divide this entire equation by 1 by rho f, the density. So basically, I'm dividing here by rho f. So we'll get a rho f here and a rho f here. And also by the characteristic velocity. So here you have v by u, right? And again, you here you have v by u. And here you have u and here you have v by u again. Right. Now, next thing I'm going to divide is by the character or multiply by the characteristic time uh, because we want a non dimensionless equation. And since we are dividing, once you have divided it by the characteristic time, and remember, what is the characteristic time? Uh, so basically, yeah, so if it uh, the, the, the time it would take to move for the fluid to move. The characteristic length say l if it is moving with velocity u so if you do that and here i have introduced a l by u uh, what you would have is this term will have value close to one because you have divided the velocity by the characteristic velocity as well as the time now if you measured so suppose your characteristic time is one second Right, but if your unit of time was one millisecond, then this would uh, look very huge, 
But if you divide by the character, I mean, if you normalize by the characteristic time, what you're trying to get is every term will be close to value one. So V by U would be a sum number close to value one. And here, once you have introduced this, right? Uh, and here also you have introduced uh, L by U and L by U, you have introduced this everywhere. So what you're going to do is L by U. So this will basically make this dimensionless. It is the length scale over which things are changing, right? So this will be absorbed here because this has dimensions one by l and this v by u will again i'm writing it as v dash which will be some number close to one and again if you do uh, again you use l to make this crack terms also close to one so this is what you're doing uh so here again grad p by rho u square right so Basically, this uh, you can introduce a half year and a half year, and this is the unit of energy. This is the unit of energy, and you had an extra L here, right? Th which will make this dimensionless. This see here, I have written grad, but here I've written grad dash, grad dash, and similarly, if you introduce L. You hear what this will is going to do is uh, essentially, uh, yeah, L U. So what I do here is introduce the L here and L squared here because I have want to make this dimensionless, and this had been made dimensionless even in this step. So I introduce the L here and the L here. So that this now becomes dimensionless. This is grad square, grad dash square, v dash, right? So if you look at this equation, you'll see that all these terms are of order one, except this quantity. So everything, even this is a dimensionless quantity, but all these terms are of order one, because you have basically normalized by the characteristic length scale, the time scale, the energy scale, and so on and so forth. And this term, rho u l by f uh, by eta, right? So if you just write it, this quantity is called the Reynolds number. If Reynolds number was small, then then one by Reynolds number, this term will be much larger compared to this term, right? And other terms, uh, so, so to change del V dash, del T dash, this will be much more dominant compared to this term. And then you can drop this term and you will have a linear equation. Okay, that's the advantage. This is the Reynolds number. On the other hand, if you have high Reynolds number, so if Reynolds number was high, when you keep this eta, then one by Reynolds number, uh, so, so, you know, so this is one, so rho ul by eta, if you have high Reynolds number, then the contribution of this term to change del v del t would be relatively less. And of course, over and above that, you can have body forces. So then, you would have turbulent flow because the nonlinear term will be more dominant to change del V dash, del T dash. So the question is whether momentum transport is by viscous forces or advective term is more dominant and that is decided by Reynolds number and a set of, of course, by the boundary condition as well. And, uh, over which it is moving and so on and so forth. So if the in addition the flow was quasi-stationary, that is del V dash del T was changing or it was changing uh, over the stretch of the over the length scale, it is not changing much, 
uh, if this was quasi stationary then you can drop this term also and then what you get is grad p minus p0 being the thermodynamic pressure and of course that's going to be constant over the length scale uh, so it's grad p by rho equal to nu grad square v and this is called the stokes flow right so at low reynolds number you can drop this and in addition if you have steady state flow then this is the equation that you have to solve okay and this is discussed in phase 314 of physical hydrodynamics okay so th that's how i've discussed the role of reynolds number which decides the relative importance of the advective term compared to the viscous terms in Navier-Stokes equation. Higher, a bit simpler than turbulent flow. We can work with a linear equation, a Stokes flow, which is quasi-stationary, right? Where viscous forces dominate. Of course, uh, if you both terms are equivalent, then you have to, I mean, you have additional complexities. So this is what uh, I already said. Now I'm going to introduce the idea of boundary layer. And uh, so this is the initial chapters of uh, physical hydrodynamics. Uh, and you need to know this idea to understand where you can use Euler flow equations or Euler equations, assuming that you don't have a turbulent flow uh, you have, uh, and suppose this is your object, and I have intentionally drawn it in an aerodynamic way. There would be flow, and it would flow past it. Now, viscous effects. So the velocity near the walls will be zero, because that's the boundary condition. Because the uh, fluid sticks at the wall. On the other hand, the transport of the fluid. So here it would be zero. But the effect of viscosity, so here it is moving at a fast speed, here it is moving zero. The length scale over which the velocity will change or the, the effect of the velocity change will be felt, assuming laminar flow, is the time taken so basically if uh, so suppose it flows over one second then the velocity change will occur over new new being the kinematic viscosity into time because if it has flowed over one one second here so the effect of this velocity being zero and here high velocity this effect will be the length scale of this effect is nu t, assuming laminar boundary layer, and you get up. So, and outside that, you can well work with Euler flow. Viscous effects are confined to the region within the boundary layer, assuming laminar flow. And if it, of course, as you go further ahead, so if you substitute. L by U, time equal to L by U. So as the fluid flows past, as the fluid moves a larger distance, the thickness of the brown boundary layer is going to increase because here it will be very thin because the time elapsed is very less. But the velocity, but the fluid is at zero velocity here. Here it is moving. So this thickness of the boundary layer would increase as it has moved this l is the distance moved along the surface right uh, and larger the distance moved along the surface longer is the time it, it will take as a consequence the uh, the momentum will have more time to diffuse out and create a velocity gradient 
of course here it could also become turbulent so you could also have a, a boundary layer uh, you can define it up to a certain length skin and later it can also become turbulent um, and it will grow on and there will be other phenomena but this is a quick for small boundaries you can actually have a small objects laminar flow you can have a boundary layer laminar boundary layer as long as Reynolds number is not too high and then you can assume Euler flow outside this boundary layer this is what i've written uh, ba uh, basically thickness of boundary layer i've just substituted time u equal to l by u and the solid bodies that lack aerodynamic shape uh, are more prone to inducing turbulent flow the flow be can become uh, turbulent and you have the phenomena of boundary layer separation and this is a huge topic by itself is in the ninth chapter of physical hydrodynamics and even in kudu it's at a later point of time but as long you have uh, streamlines and euler flow you can use this bernoulli's equation to calculate or quantify various quant uh, quantities and it's relatively easy to do that compared to a turbulent flow Transition can turb uh, to turbulence can happen at Reynolds number of 2000 or even closer to 1 or to transition to can turbulent can happen even as high as 10 to the power 5. And it depends upon the nature and shape of the obstacle, the velocity of course, the Reynolds number of course, and also the roughness of the ob uh, obstacle. So when exactly a fluid will become non-turbulent under a given a set of conditions is not exactly perfectly a solved problem. And fluid can become turbulent, as you see. I mean, there's not a universal number that it will become turbulent. It will depend on the Reynolds number and many other cases and boundaries and so on and so forth. So it's every time you have to calculate or observe or measure when the transition takes place. So this is the background. This is how you work with Levi-Stokes equation. In the last five or ten minutes, what I'm going to do is quickly discuss uh, some boundary value problems where you're going to take Stokes equation because it's simple. So if you, if you want, we just want to try to take various simple limiting cases to develop an intuition for fluid flow. Okay. So this is the Stokes equation, grad p, the velocity, any vel uh, changes in velocity is driven by grad p and in addition, of course, you need uh, uh, boundary conditions. Now, the simple shear flow, also called the planar quiet flow, is the traditional clay, uh, case where you have a fluid between two walls separated by a distance a, say, suppose along the y direction, and you give a time t equal to zero, um, a velocity v0 in the x direction, you move the wall uh, by velocity v0. There will be transients essential initially, but after some point, you will reach a steady state. Velocity will get a steady state profile, and it is at that time that you are going to write down the del p del x. The Stokes equation will be del p del x because velocity change is uh, the velocity change is in the y direction. Hence, you have eta. There should be an eta here. Del two v x del y two because that's the only term which will survive. Or that there's no velocity change. In the z direction or in the uh, x direction, but the reason you have uh, the reason you have um, a, a gradient of pressure uh, is basically due to rho g, the hydrostatic pressure difference. So del p del y. That's that's that which you will have. Now, if that is ignored, if you assume there's there is no uh, there is no pressure gradient here due to gravity, then as you are moving the wall, you are not creating a pressure gradient. You are just changing the boundary condition, right? Hence, if you ignore del p del x equal to minus rho g, all that you have is eta del two v x del two y equal to zero. And when you solve for it, Vx equal to Cy plus C0. That's that's 
that's what you get right and you see i mean you know that you had a linear profile but here what we did is use the stokes equation to derive the linear profile vx equal to cy plus c0 the boundary conditions are once it has reached steady state uh, there's no explicit time dependence that uh, v equal to v0 at y equal to a and v equal to zero at y equal to zero and you just have to solve for it and you can get uh, just get uh, you, you can easily get uh, that's equal to v0 by a so vx equal to v0 by a which is the is velocity gradient essentially into y right what would be the force force is eta del vx del y so the you have to apply You have to apply eta into v0 by a because that's constant throughout the flow to move the top wall or keep moving it. So in steady state, each layer of fluid, however, is moving with steady velocity. Remember, it's not changing as a function of time. So net force on each layer is equal to zero. Once it has reached steady state, each layer is being pulled by the by the layer opposite or uh, just over it in the y direction but it is also being pulled in the opposite direction by the layer lower than it in the y direction so net force on each layer is zero because it feels equal and opposite forces and hence it doesn't accelerate or change the function of time but of course initially there are unequal forces because the top layer is moving faster the bottom layer is not moving at all uh, so of course it is going to be accelerated till it reaches the steady state profile right so this is commented in the physical hydronics books um okay now we are uh, so this was basically quit flow where you don't put a pressure gradient you just move the top wall and pull it by a force equal to a force per unit area actually force per unit area right because that stress per unit area will eta v0 by a and of course you have a larger area of fluid you have to give double the force now force between parallel walls due to pressure gradient now suppose you have a pressure gradient then the stokes equation will be uh, uh, and the boundary conditions will be velocity at the walls uh, is zero so the walls are not moving hence the velocity of the fluid at the walls will be zero so the equation will be eta del 2 vx del y2 again you have a pressure gradient in this direction say so this fluid after time t plus delta t has moved here uh, and suppose the pressure gradient is constant. Remember, the fluid will move opposite in direction to the pressure gradient. So there it comes with a minus sign and call it k. Then you can integrate this equation again, right? Because this time you have a constant. So here you will get eta vx kappa y square. So this is, I mean, you have to integrate it twice, hence you get this and vx is now a function of y because here the center will move fast but at the walls you have non-zero uh, i mean sorry zero velocity hence you will have vx of, is a function of y right um, how to get it please please use the boundary con conditions and figure it out and you can calculate that the v max will be at the center of this flow will be it will maximum at y equal to a0 by 2 um, and it will be so that's where the v max will be and its value will be del p del x or this k value is square by a eta moreover um, moreover if you if you basically so you know you have a layer of fluid uh, and different layers of fluid are moving at different velocities. So over a matter of time, this fluid would have moved here. 
and the amount of fluid which is flowing here to the center there is more velocity uh, there is higher velocity so more fluid is flowing per unit time closer to the walls there is less fluid flowing per unit time so the total amount of fluid flowing per unit time you have to integrate from 0 to a vx dy and if you calculate it you will get a cube so if this a the distance between the walls increases a is the distance between the walls so vx equal to uh, zero at y equal to a and vx equal to zero this should be x um it is zero at y equal to a so a is the distance between the walls and the amount of fluid which is flowing per unit uh width of channel right because you know uh, these are two plates uh, and i have not specified uh what is the i mean we don't we are considering an infinite uh boundary uh, infinite layer of fluid in the direction into the plane of the computer so that's the width if you like so flow rate per unit time per unit width of channel in the z direction is, is what you have to integrate in the y direction because in different because different different planes you have different fluid velocities and different amounts of fluid which is flowing hence vx this is a function of y dy to integrate that per unit time uh, to get uh, you know um, and and then you get this expression uh, last thing is flow in a cylindrical coordinates so you have to basically write laplacian in cylindrical coordinates and we are again looking at flow through a pipe where the walls the velocity of the walls is static uh, and it is moving due to a pressure gradient suppose the pressure gradient is in the z direction and rho is the cylindrical coordinate uh, radius vector the radius of this channel is r so what you again have written is del p del l equal to kappa minus del p del z in cylindrical coordinates this laplacian as you can guess the center will be the highest velocity the velocity is zero at the walls this is the expression for the laplacian one by rho del del rho i mean you can ch check it up right and you have velocity only in the z direction and that is changing as a function of rho and there is symmetry in the theta direction hence the theta term won't contribute hence this equation this equation uh, becomes something like this this is the laplacian uh, in the cylindrical coordinates and the boundary conditions uh, is that at uh, rho equal to r equal to 0 vz uh, equal to 0 right uh, and if you solve for it if you solve for it uh, you can get that the maximum velocity will be kappa r square by 4 eta right and the total volume flowing through this would be vz 2 pi rho basically you take a you take a thin uh, strip uh, and through it per unit time per unit term now this is bounded remember you don't have to say per unit width of the channel here you can really 2 pi um, so 2 pi rho is the circumference d rho so amount of fluid flowing through it per unit time is the uh, and you integrate from 0 to r and if you do that uh, you will get you, you can of course have to first get the uh, expression for vz and you will get pi kappa kappa being this r to the power 4 8 eta so if you increase the radius by 10 percent say so it had value 1 and become 1.1 1 
the amount of fluid flow however will be 1.1 to the power 4 the increase in the volume of the fluid will be significantly more so hence this exponent this large exponent a slight increase in the radius will lead to a much huge uh, bigger fluid flow assuming you are able to keep kappa the same and of course viscosity is kept the same uh, so the rest uh, so this is left for you as assignment and uh, with that i'll end the class right now on this recording right now